Right on. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. We could not be more grateful to have Damien Kulash with us. Uh, Damien and his musical accomplices at OK Go have attained viral video success again and again through their self-directed music videos, viewed more than 150 million times. OK Go has been called the first post-internet band as their success took off by using the connectivity and the shareability that the web offers. Damien is also an advocate of open web principles, which is best illustrated in his testimony to Congress on net neutrality legislation by, and by some of his essays published in places like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, NPR's All Things Considered, and many others. The band's awards include a Grammy, a Webby Lifetime Achievement Award, a Public Knowledge IP3 Award, two UK MVAs, YouTube Most Creative Award, and countless others from major film festivals. I think one of the questions today is going to be how Damien keeps all of those stored in one big trunk to carry them around. But we are lucky to have him here. We are going to invite him to talk for 15 or 20 minutes about the work he's doing and things he'd like to have on our mind. And then we will open things up for questions and invite folks out there in blue, Big Blue Button Land to shoot questions and, and find out what is on Damien's mind. But without further ado, Damien, so good to have you with us. Do tell us what is on your midnight mind. Thank you. Uh, I admit, not a whole lot is on my midnight mind. It's, um, it's, it's, it's always a thrill to know you're talking to somebody who is in the past. You guys are in the past. You realize that I'm, I, I am, in fact, I'm on a different one. Um, uh, so I, I guess I should tell you a little bit about our band and how we came to be and why I'm here in the first place. Um, uh, so, you know, jump in with a question whenever you got one because I've heard this all before. Uh, we started, um, you know, I, I met our bassist Tim Nordwind when I was 12 years old at summer camp. And uh, we, he lived in Michigan. I, I grew up in Washington, D.C. We used to trade mixtapes long distance, um, stayed friends for years and years. I introduced him to another friend who I knew would be going to uh, college in Chicago, where Tim was going to college. Um, the two of them formed a band in college. I moved to Chicago after I got done with college in 1990, 1998. Yes, I'm that old. Wow, that's like the same. Some of you were born in the year I got out of college. I am so old. Um, OK, so we, uh, I, I moved to Chicago. We started the rock band, uh, OK Go. We got signed to a major label about three years later, two years later maybe, which was a huge, big thing. It was awesome. Um, that's how at, at that time you got to make music. Basically, you could be on a major label, you could be on an indie label, um, you could try to put it out yourself. And uh, make, indies uh, had a pretty hard time getting music around to kids in the world at that time. Super lucky to get a pretty good deal with this major label. We, you know, we've released our first record in 2002, um, and had a moderate-sized radio hit. Of, it was a song called "Get Over It," which um, got in the top 20, I think, but not like the top one or top five. You know, not not one of those things that makes people go like, you know, we're going to make the billions of dollars. We better pour more money into this project. So. Um, but also not bad enough that they dropped us. So we got to our second record, 2004, 2005, 2005, I think. Um, by which, by which point we hadn't, you know, like we were, we were sort of in the the vast desert wasteland of major labels, which is to say, you're, you know, you, you, it's worth a little bit of money to bet on you, on, on you. Like they'll they'll pay for your record to get made. They won't promote it. They won't make a video for it. They won't do much for it. But yeah, you know, they might as well. Just in case you explode overnight or something, they might as well keep you on the label. Um, and uh, that was about the time um, internet video started actually having a life of its own. I'll go back a step or two. In 2001, maybe, we'd made a series of 10 short films that we wanted to distribute on the internet. But of course, there wasn't really a way to distribute them on the internet or not a good one. Um, and uh, we sort of always thought of ourselves primarily as people who just like to make stuff, and music happens to be one of those things that we knew how to make and could, you know, could figure out a way to get it out there in the world. 
Um, so 2005 rolls along, and the label stops paying attention to us. And we um, had come up with this totally ludicrous dance routine that we like to do on stage as part of our live show. It sort of become like our signature to end our show with this ridiculous dance routine because nothing really freaks out the audience more than seeing a, a self-respecting rock band drop their instruments and start acting like a boy band. It like really, really freaks people out. Kind of puts people in, it's, it's like a gauntlet. It's like, it, it's like you are not, now you are going to have to smile or you're going to have to leave. Like you can't stand here and act like hipster and cool anymore. You're gonna have to actually have a good time. So we were doing this, we, we had come up with this dance, new album 2005, new dance 2005. We hired my sister, well, we hire. We invited my sister to come help us. She was a professional ballroom dancer at the time. She came out to my house in Los Angeles. We were, we were, we were living at that time, and we um, choreographed this dance. Shot a home video of that dance uh, uh, that was hilarious, and it wasn't meant as a rock video. It was just like a, a rehearsal tape, basically, and we thought it was so funny that we that we shared it with a couple of our friends and you know, just literally emailed it to them. Someone put it up on a site called iFilm, which uh, was a precursor to YouTube. And a month or two later, we noticed it had been downloaded, I think, 300,000 times. And that was as many records as we had sold to date. I think our whole first album did about 300,000 copies, which is, again, great. But if you can, if in a few weeks, you can make something and give it directly to 300,000 people out there in the world without a major label in between, without anyone telling you how to do it, without anyone trying to control how it's done, we thought this was pretty awesome. So we went into our record label and we said, guys, we've got this awesome rock video. And we showed it to the brand new head of digital, the, the, the brand new, like, um, I remember we called it back then. I think it was called New Media back then. And this guy had just been hired, and we, should, we were like, get this. this it's going to blow up the internet. Watch. We showed him the video, and he watched it. And the first words out of his mouth, he turned in, in this weird kind of half British accent he had. He said, if that gets out, you're sunk. That's the head of, that's the, head of the internet department in EMI. And... Um, so we put it out anyways, of course. I mean, it was already out, so there's nothing you could do about it. But um, it, you know, it kept it kept moving around the internet, obviously, without much help from the record label. Um, and we decided, look, if we can do that by accident, you know, if we if we've reached 300,000 fans, or, or not even fans, just people, people who are interested in this, people who think it's funny, people who think it's whatever, um, we should, you know, if we can do that by accident, we should we should do it on purpose. And I'm, I remember thinking. Okay, the people who watch internet videos in 2005, they're like, you know, they're nerds, and they're, they're like the, you know, hyper techy dude at work, whatever, and they're probably not our coolest fans, they're probably not our average fans, but they might be our most, like, dedicated fans. They might be the people who, who, who we now have the, the most direct personal connection with. So, surely 300,000 is, is as many of those people as exist in the world. Like, that, we had saturated the whole thing, clearly. But, you know, we might as well make them another, another gift because now we've got this, like, really great connection with these people. So we went to my sister's house in Orlando, Florida, and we recorded, uh, we recorded ourselves doing another dance, this time on treadmills. And uh, we made this thing, and it was, we were pretty proud of it. We thought it was pretty awesome. We also thought, you know, we're going to become that band that just does, like, dance things. And, you know, do we really want to do that? So we thought about it a little bit. And we also figured, you know, Okay, it's cool we're dancing on treadmills, but we already did this dance thing. Like, maybe it's too similar to the last one. I don't know. So we we so we sat on it for a few months. We decided we didn't put it out for a while. Showed it to our label, who were, by this time were like, yeah, maybe the videos are working, but I mean, I don't know. And they took a copy of it and put it on and did their big big release on a a, a website called StupidVideos.com. Thank you very much, label. And uh, luckily, we were playing a show in Moscow that night, and and um, and so we saw it up there before it before it anyone was awake in the states, and uh, had it taken down as quick as possible, and then put it up ourselves a, a couple weeks later on a site called YouTube, which our label had never heard of, and then and in fact couldn't spell correct. Like I don't know how you misspell YouTube, but they managed to for six straight months thereafter. Um, that got a million hits in a day, or it was 600,000 or something like that the first day, but it was, you know, a few, a few million in the first week, and our minds, like, were literally blown. It was like, there's no, 
I thought I actually thought there was like a, a, a like a accounting error, you know, that like we were off by a zero because there's just no way, you know. And um, it, it just you know it was like sort of it was one of the first really big viral videos on YouTube, and uh, it, it, MTV picked it up, VH1 picked it up. All of a sudden, you know, we were kind of everywhere, and the label, of course, now was like, what a great idea this was! This is an amazing idea, and, you know. Um, and started actually doing standard promotion. You know, they started doing the, the radio campaign and all that kind of stuff, and it was like this great, this, you know, this amazing few month period for us. And then we faced a new problem, which is that obviously once you have had this like insane weird success like that, you're pretty, you can be pretty sure you are going to spend the rest of your life being that dude who danced on treadmills. And 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 you have to decide whether or not. Um, you want to embrace that or fight it. You know, there's like the the Radiohead method where they where they like you know they say that they hate their first big single because like oh, that's not what we want to sound like, and or you know or you just embrace it like that's but like, that was the big crazy thing we did. And yeah, we love you know what? we love doing crazy stuff. So um, so as we were making our third record, we um, we we kind of you know embraced that that theory more generally. Like you know what what works is when we have good ideas. What works is when we have our, like, when we actually chase ideas that other people might not be having, not when we try to tailor, you know, get ourselves to be more like what everybody else wants us to be like. And so the record was sound, sounded pretty different, and when it came out, we decided we'd just, we'd, we'd go whole hog at, at, the, at, the, at making videos, you know. Um, we'd learn to direct them a little bit ourselves, and, and instead of trying to be cool and trying to sort of, like, you know, get ourselves into, you know, get people to forget the last one that happened and just build on it. So um, since then, I think we've made 10-ish, maybe eight or 10 videos, and they've gotten hundreds of millions of hits. And um, I'm actually, the reason I'm in France is that we're at, at this advertising festival. We're getting advertising awards. Like, I didn't even know we were advertising. Cool. Getting all sorts of awards. And, um, and uh, never, you know, I, I feel more, more, Clearly now than ever that that a good that you know good ideas speak for themselves and it's it's um, if you know, it's like super easy to basically just figure out your best ideas and then chase them chase them really hard because like it's it's usually like the having of good ideas is not that tough getting them made getting them done getting them actually like threading the needle through all of the uh, you know it, it, all of the obstacles that's the difficult part. how is that. Did I summarize myself? That, that was super interesting. Yes, thank you very much. So I think um, what I think a lot of folks probably on this call are curious about is when did you get interested in sort of being a part of open web and sort of caring about this internet that transmits your amazing videos? Um, that was around 2004. Um, it, during, during uh, I, I, um, was doing a lot of of involvement in politics around the 2004 election cycle, um, uh, and then even more in 2008. And make sure I've got that. But yeah, no, it was 2004. Um, and I, a bunch of uh, sort of politically minded future of music folks, including really the Future of Music Coalition and an amazing group called um, Air Traffic Control. Uh, we're working on on electoral politics, and we were working really hard to try to get our fans um, registered to vote, and trying to and trying to make sure that other bands around us were actually using their cultural power to get people invested and interested in voting. And in the course of of, of those political discussions, I started dealing with a lot of people in music tech policy, and um, started to realize how dangerous the Situation was at that time with with uh, you know big internet carriers, broadband carriers, telcos, uh, basically trying to kind of hijack the internet. And um, I got pretty active, and uh, you know I testified before Congress, like you said in your intro, and I wrote a bunch of of op eds for the New York Times, and Washington Post, and stuff. Very cool. Uh, in the audience today, we've got a lot of young video makers, and so I'm curious. Uh, we're about to start taking questions from those fine people, but I'm curious what advice you would have for them about sort of cooking up their own web videos. You know, sort of any uh, just sort of uh, inspiration you might have about ways that they might uh, want to approach the creative process for visual yeah. content on the open web. Okay, here's let me make let me see if I can actually do this in a non-rambly fashion. 
Um, clearly, I'm I, I'm good at rambling, not so good at non-rambling. Um, you should know this. You should know this medium way better than I do. You should know this medium way better than anyone does. Um, the you need to not think about making videos and applying them to the web. Like, don't think about what you've seen on TV or what you've even seen in video games and, and try to figure out a way that you can make new films just in this new dimensional, differently dimensional space. You're, this is how you live. This is how everyone consumes everything. This is how you're talking to me right now. This is how, this is how your, your life goes. This is the canvas on which you're going to make your art. Um, I'm here with, in this advertising conference and these people really fundamentally do not get it. Like what, what the, you know, they grew up with television advertising and now they're trying to figure out some way to shove it into, you know, like how are we going to do this on the web? And you know, they grew up with films and they're trying to figure out how are we going to do this so that it, you know, so that it's multi-channel or it's interactive and, you know, it's like they're trying to take a, a book and make it into a video game, you know? It's like they're, they're both very valuable, they're just different things. And, you, you guys should be making, making artwork for this space. You probably shouldn't even think of it as video. I realize that that's kind of, uh, that, I mean, this is a video tool we're talking about using, but, but think about what the, what the parameters of this medium are. Think about this canvas and then make something awesome on that canvas, you know? You got a square canvas. Don't just keep drawing circles, you know? Boom. Fantastic advice. So I don't know if you can see the little chat window, but let me read you some great questions that have come up there, and I'll just take them in order. So the first one that came up, have you talked to the guy at EMI since he said you're sunk? Yes, uh, I, I have talked to him a bunch of times. Um, I, I, the, the funny end to that story is that, uh, you know, the, the, the smart play when you're a rock band has, has a label that's not spending a lot of money and then wants to start spending money is just shut up and let them say whatever they want. So when, you know, when things started going well, uh, you know, when they decided, oh, wow, this really is a hit, um, you, a, a little newspaper called USA Today called, like, you know, the biggest newspaper in the country and wanted to do a big story on the success of this thing. And suddenly uh, the publicity department was like, no, nah, I don't think you should do that. And, you know, mock management 101, obviously when, you, when the biggest newspaper in the country wants to write a big piece about you, that's a pretty good thing. We're like, why, why would they... How could they possibly be trying not to, you know, to shut them down? how would they be trying to shut this down? And it turned out that they were just scared I would tell the story. So they they said it was okay to do the okay, let's do the interview as long as that same guy, the head of digital, is in the room with you. So we sat at this round table in New York with the, the it was like, you know, the triangle is the guy from the label, there's me, there's a writer from USA Today, and the, the writer would ask questions back and forth and it was really nice. I was like, yeah, the labels, but you know, the labels been so supportive. They've done such good work. And to be fair, I wasn't really lying. Like, you know, it just took them a while to come around, but they once they realized what they had, they tried really hard. His 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 big pull quote in the article was, uh, "OK Go represents the most successful internet ca campaign that Capital has ever waged." So felt good about that one. I so wanted to be like, "Tell your son." But you know, <laughs> um, they 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 did eventually turn around. They turned around from this is this is kind of a waste, isn't doing much. And then it was like, oh, this is really great promotion for you. And then it was like, wait a minute, you're making this cool art, and no one's paying for it. We should shut it down. And so uh, by 2008, 2009, something like that, they had taken they had pulled the the, the uh, treadmill video off of YouTube and put it on Vivo. Um, so that they could make, you know, a, a tiny bit more per. Oh, no, it didn't even exist yet. They pulled. They had shut. They shut down embedding on the video because they wanted to make sure that people couldn't play it on their blog, because they get better. They got better advertising click-throughs, you know, CPM on an actual YouTube page. They figured if they could stop people from playing it elsewhere, they'd get more money. And just it, what that means is just people stop watching it. If it's not on someone's blog, where are they going to see it? You know. So that was another little round of, of fights in the public. You know, like I wrote a, 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 a well, I'm sorry, a Washington Post piece about that, and you know, we got in this big fight about embeddability, and eventually we just decided it'd be better if we uh, weren't on that label anymore. I mean, sorry, collectively we decided that they were actually pretty nice to us in terms of the way they let us leave. They they realized that we were doing well in spaces that they 
didn't know how to make money in and didn't feel like being in. They they don't want to you know they 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 were not there to try to figure out how you how you make new art and new culture and new experiences online and on YouTube and you know on your cell phone or wherever. They're there to try to figure out how you can get a series of ones and zeros that represents a song to make them some money. You know, and that's it. That's a, a fine business model for them. But for us, we just want to make cool shit and we'll figure out how to make the money later. I just said shit to a teenagers. I'm, am, I, am I allowed to say this is the internet? I can say shit. Right, right on. We won't tell. Cool. I've know. got a bunch of questions queued up for you. Um, right. So Caleb wants to know, what does it feel like to win a Grammy and what do you do after achieving that level of success? Uh, it feels pretty cool to win a Grammy. Um, I, honestly, I don't think, you know, awards in general, it, 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 there's always this weird uh, sort of like silence after one because what do you do? I mean, it's a statue, you know. It's like it's amazing that somebody has recognize this, but it was actually the making of, of the thing that's exciting. And, and it's the chasing of your dreams that's exciting. You know, it's like when it, you wake up one morning with some idea, like, you're like, you know, I want to do this totally insane thing. And, and the idea of the possibility that that might happen, that's, you know, that, uh, I mean, I presume it's the same thing for everybody, uh, uh, you know, who's listening right now. That when things go well, it's super, you know, it's, it's nice to celebrate it, but you can't really do anything with the celebration. It's not like, once you have a Grammy, you're a happier person. It's sort of like, well, you know, what you're thinking about now is what you want to do next. You know? Yep. But yeah. No, that makes total sense. So I guess that leads to the next question very organically. How do you come up with your ideas? Wyatt wants to know. Uh, how do I? I? I think, I mean, for the most part is, um, I, I think good creative constraints make for good ideas. Respond, you know, give your, either get, go get a brief from somebody or give yourself a brief, you know. Make a, um, you know, the, our most recent video is one, we, it was aired on the Super Bowl by Chevy and it's, us, it's me driving in this car playing instruments with robotic arms outside of the car and that really just came from me going like, what would I, you know, what, what rock, what's the most rock and roll thing we can do with the car? Like, what, what, you know, like what rock video would we make with the car? Um, and when you start to, when, when you have to like respond to something, when you figure out some, you know, when you give, again, when you give yourself uh, the boundaries, you know, figure out what your canvas is, like, and then push up against the edges of it. Oh, and also, um, d deal with emotions, don't deal with technology. I mean, I know that we're here talking about, about using this technology in a smart way, but the only smart way, the only lasting way, the only meaningful way that you can use it is to communicate to other humans. Like you're not, it doesn't matter that you're the first people using stuff, it, because someday the stuff is all going to be boring and old. And what's going to matter is that you said something with it. You know, it doesn't like, people still watch movies from the 40s and it's not because they were like, you know, spectacularly well edited, it's because they were, they were, they express something, so you feel it, you know. And um, that is, you know, we're, we are often mistaken for being um, novel or because we are unique and, and there really is a big difference. Like we don't, we don't go and find new technologies and then figure out what can we do with this that no one's done before. We say, what does this allow us to do that we couldn't before emotionally? Like, what, like what's, what's the thing we can communicate with this that we couldn't before? And, and, uh, it, 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 while you you know they're very similar ideas, there's a a big big difference in in what types of work you'll actually make when you think that way. Very great point. Thank you. Um, that leads into a question we've got from Seattle. They are confessing that their videos aren't quite as entertaining as OK goes, and they want to know if you have any tips on how to make a social justice video go viral. And we've also got a question after that: How do you get your own video to stand out from others? Uh, social justice video going viral. Um, here's what you should do: you should make it uh, uplifting and fun, and that's really hard. Social justice. Because so often the point of a social justice video is to show how wrong something is. Who's got the feedback? Is it? Um, can you guys still hear me? I think we're good. Don't know what happened there. Um, so uh, here's why things go viral. 
and it's really obvious, but people overlook it all the time because people want to share them. Yeah, right. But it's it. Think about what you actually want to give to your friend. Like think about the person next to you. Think about your mom. Think about your girlfriend. Think about your boyfriend. Think about whatever your dog. I don't know. Like you 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 want to make people's lives better. Rarely do people go like, wow, that thing is horrifying and scary. I'd love to show it to my mom. You know, like. Oh boy, that made me feel like the world is about to end. Like Jennifer will love this, you know. Like um, people share, people want to enrich each other's lives and, and and make their friendships closer and stronger. And that's why, like, so when you see something that's surprising and full of wonder and full of joy or full full of humor, that's when you spread things. And and uh, I, the problem again with social justice is that generally the message for a lot of these things is like something is truly effed up out there and we need to change it. So one way, one, one thing you might think about doing is, is, is trying to find the humor in that point because there probably is one. There, I saw a really good video this morning, uh, I mean an ad for a, a dog shelter and it's just two guys in dog costumes talking to each other and you can't figure out what, like it's just so totally ludicrous and then you realize you know, and, and then just at the end, there's like a little a little heartstring tug. It's like, really, you should go adopt a dog, you know. Um, but instead of showing you what's scary and horrible out there, maybe try to maybe try to figure out the way through your social justice issue that people will want to share because their friends like it rather than get scared of it. How do I make my videos stick out? Is that the next question? Um, uh, same basic answer, actually. It's just, you know, we... We gen we're really lucky to have found ourselves in a place where we kind of have we have sort of made a a, a, a medium for ourselves. You know, um, we do these sort of you know these basically our idea. We we try to think of something that's not possible but is right up against the edge of possible, so that maybe if we work hard enough, we can pull it into this side, like get it out of impossible and into possible at least for a short moment. Um, and it's the the upside of that is that we usually come up with things that nobody else is stupid enough to try. Um, or uh, the downside is that we come up with things that nobody else is stupid enough to try. Well, that's a balance to strike. Hey, here's one for you. Do you think young artists should aim to have an independent artistic career as you've chosen to do now, rather than sign to a label or work for a company? Uh, I think young artists should make art, and I think that um, I, I, I'm not one to say to be on a high horse about it either way. Like no, no one knows what the system is or will be, um, you know, now or five years from now. And you got to eat, you know. Um, and there's no um, the 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 balance to strike is 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 to figure out, you know, can can you can you still love what you do, and can you um, can you figure out ways to support it that aren't going to make you, you know, stay up at night and want to kill yourself? Like, um, we work with advertisers. You know, we work with corporations. Uh, there's, you know, I, I would love it if we ne if there if we never had to deal with finding money for things, but you have to, you know. And, and we were on a major label for a long time, and despite our disagreements and the things that obviously I was making fun of them from before, there was a plenty about that situation that was great for us. Um, and, and certainly in years when we, you know, we toured on our second record, we toured for 31 months, more than two and a half years, two and a half, two and a half years um, without stopping. And, you know, a lot, that takes a lot of support from label and you're not always making money during those times. So, I don't think there's one rule. What I, uh, other than chase chase the thing that's going to allow you to make your art. You know, if you feel like if you if you have to make compromises such that you're not making things you love, you're not things that you're proud of, things that that feel like they're actually sharing the thing you want to share with the world, then it, then not, then it's not worth it. Um, but you're going to have to make a compromise somewhere. You're going to have to get a job. You're going to have to get a label. You're going to have to get you know, unless you're independently wealthy, in which case you're probably not asking me this question. Great answer. Hey, I guess, uh, just a parallel one for the online world. Is it more important to cultivate a fan base on YouTube, or should emerging artists direct people to their own websites? Peter G wants to know. Uh, I think you should you you should go to where the people are. Um, there's no it, 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 that is if you're if you're trying to share your art with the world, go you know go where the world is. Um, I you know we I. I 
I don't think, you know, it takes take a pretty special circumstance to get us not to want to post something on YouTube simply because it's where we know people will go and, and search for things. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the it's sort of standard medium. That is not to say it's necessarily the best medium. It's not to say that, that there aren't um, alternatives that might serve your art way better elsewhere. You know, things that have better video technology directly or better, you know, all sorts of interactive and, and uh, you know, HTML5 technologies that, you, that could make, that could allow you to make much better art. So it's, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't think, I guess it's sort of back to the same basic answer, which is that I wouldn't go, I, I would not put your, your political flag before your, your work. Um, make, make your work and figure out where, it, you know, and, and figure out the, the, the way to get it to the people you want to get it to. Nice. I want to do a shout out for, yeah, that was great. Shout out for Bayvac, who's on the call, and they've got a very technical production question. How did you get all the dogs to do all that choreography? That is a good. That's a very technical question. It's it, um, food is how we got the dogs to do all that choreography. Um, each there there are fourteen dogs in that video, um, and there are twelve dog trainers. And uh, so each of the dogs, and sometimes a pair of dogs, had one trainer dealing with them specifically. And in fact, you can go online and uh, go online. <laughs> Not online. There, um, if you search for, I think it's called Take 72 Other Angles, um, uh, there, you can see that, that that is all one take. That, um, it's either Take 72 or 73, and you can, we were filming it from lots of different angles so you could see the process, and you can actually see all the trainers talking to their dogs. Um, my dog, Bunny, the little brown one, he comes in on the table at, about a third of the way through and does this. Um, You'll see that someone has a tennis ball with cheese whiz on it, and they're just doing this with the tennis ball, and she's going. So that's how we got them to do it. Nice. And the next Don't production feed your dog question. Cheese, by the way, that's, I'm not telling you to feed your dog cheese whiz. It's just that's what we're important talking. safety tip. Yeah. So, uh, so the next production question from NCTV: How many takes did Here It Goes Again take to get it right, and how much practice time did it take to do the choreography right? Uh, Here It Goes Again was done in a total of, of eight days. It was, a, it was over a 10 day period in Florida. Um, we did the choreography for, you know, it, was, it was sort of like figure out, figure out the arrangement of the treadmills and what sorts of ideas we might do in the first day. Next day was um, just like hurling ourselves at the machines and seeing what happened pretty much because Pretty counterintuitive what is going to work and what isn't. Um, uh, and once we had a, once that built a sort of lexicon of, of moves, once we had a kind of vocabulary of like we can do this move and this move and this move, then we spent maybe two or three days uh, stringing them together so that we could keep people on the screen all the time because what a treadmill just it basically, it, like when you're done with a move on a treadmill, you're either being thrown off the screen or you're being sucked into the middle where it just sort of tries to eat you. So, um, so uh, once we had strung it all together, uh, we had the final choreography in the night. Well, we shot for two days, um, and I think, or maybe it was only one day, but we got, we, we, I think we had like 17 or 19 numbered takes. Mm -hmm. Something asked that question. Very before. nice. Hey, so uh, Kobe wants to know, was it interesting to meet other famous people? Um, yeah, it is interesting to meet other famous people. Uh, it's, it's also funny to watch your own reaction, like how um, some people, sometimes it's just totally like, like, oh wow, that's, you know, that's a famous movie star. But it's just like, they seem like a really normal person and I'm not feeling weird about it. And then other times it's like, oh my god, that's that's Barack Obama, and you and like you, you're like, oh, that picture, I you like you kind of do all the things that people do, and um, you want to see something funny? I got, I, 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 saw, I saw Bill Clinton on the street today. Um, where's my phone? Uh, I, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't actually meet him, but Bill Clinton spoke at the same conferences I did today, and, and so I saw him on the street. You guys want to see a picture of Bill Clinton? Um, so uh, you know, mostly the the thing that's fun, that's fun about meeting other notable people is is like 
when you meet people whose work you really admire and, and you get to see the personality behind it, you know? That's Bill Clinton. You're welcome, world, Bill Clinton. What's that? He's looking good. Yes, so we've got one nice. more. We've got one more production question for you. How did you know the Rube Goldberg machine was going to work? Uh, we didn't know the Rube Goldberg machine was going to work, and that's that is, I think, why it's good. Um, we spent about six months on that. Um, from from beginning to end, uh, the the actual build was was you know somewhere between three weeks and two months I guess, kind of depending on what you consider the build. But um, it uh, we had very we had very fun, interesting, smart people working on it with us. And I would, um, there a, a group called Sin Labs. Um, they didn't actually exist as a group until that. Um, they were sort of a bunch of people we found. Well, that's a longer story. We didn't put them together, but the company started in the middle of that project, and um, they're super smart, and we knew that their engineering was spectacular, and so we knew we'd get something out of it. The real, the, the challenge for us, challenge for me as a filmmaker, so to speak, as, or us as a band, was to make it musical and to make it visual. Um, the engineers didn't tend to think in terms of how a camera sees things. They thought in terms of how the thing actually works. So. Um, a good example is a pulley. Like it's, it's, it, you know, a pulley is a really good way to get, uh, get a mechanical action from low down to happen high up. And so when you've got all this potential energy and things are falling all the time, what happens when something hits the ground? You can't go more down than that. You can use a pulley. It can fall. The last thing you can do is hit a pulley, and something up there will happen. Problem is when two parts of a pulley they move at the same time, so you can't film them both at the same time. If this moves, you look over there. It's already happened, and so can't really use pulley very much in a Rube Goldberg machine that you intend to film all the parts of. Um, uh, and, you know, so going, th w keeping the, the, the engineers focused on what, on what story could be told rather than just what technology can be used was sometimes um, a challenge. But, I mean, in, j just in, in that, like, uh, you know what we brought to it was a sort of vision of how of how this thing should look and feel, and what they brought to it was a very specific physics that was going to make it work. Who is Bill Clinton? He was the president for a while. Oh, that's Brett. He, Brett. Yeah, those Canadians, man. I tell you. Hey, we got a couple more. Um, so let's see. Um, Eileen wanted to get inside your head. She was asking, "What do you fear most, and how does it impact your video making?" <laughs> Spiders. I fear spiders. Um, uh, what do I fear most? I fear mediocrity, and I fear um, uh, I fear not being proud. Um, I, I really like I really like the feeling of like yeah, we did it, and so um, that empty feeling of we kind of got it is it good enough? Like that's a bad feeling for me. Um, uh, and in terms of the videos, I, I think it just, you know, it means that we, um, we, we don't tend to do things that we don't, that we don't think there's a high likelihood of being proud of. I realize that sounds circular, but we didn't get into this, it, like, this sort of leads to a whole different point, but did, uh, people outside of this universe, I suspect that you guys get this because of you know, the forum we're in here, you, we're talking about, about online artwork, we're talking about creative stuff making. Um, people outside this universe tend to think, you know, you're a rock band and you did a really good job marketing yourself. Like, like we, made, we made the real product music and then we went and made the, like the advertising product, the video. Um, that's how the whole, the whole record industry looked at it and that's still largely how the public looks at it. Um, we don't see it that way at all. You know, we, 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 we make, we chase our, our, our most exciting ideas and at, at one point you had to figure out what categories they went into. Like this is, uh, you know, if you're a musician, the outlet is EDs. You know, and if you're a, a filmmaker, the outlet is commercials, videos, long form films. And that's not the case anymore. Now all of us work in this space. We're all working in ones and zeros and there's not a huge difference in it. Like, you, you can choose what to decode them with down the line, but the, but the point is we're all working in interactivity, we're all working in film, we're all working in video, we're all working in music, we're all working in experience, we're all working in 
you know, creating experiences for one another that are much more three-dimensional. And uh, so what, as we sort of stumbled into this realization, you know, when we started making things and realizing, wow, these are sort of like, this is like a rock video, but it doesn't look like a rock video, it doesn't feel like a rock video. And we also realized it didn't really work like a rock video, that these videos actually, they're like an artwork we make and we care about them the same way we care about our music and our concerts and all the other artworks we work on. And um, so, uh, what was that? oh yeah, so, so we never would have gotten into that. It wasn't like, well, we need some video, so it's got to be something. Uh, you know, it's like we just we make things that we're proud of, and then we only show them to people if we're proud of them. So we never, you know, like we don't start video projects that we think it, that we have to. We start video projects that we want to. Do. Right on. Absolutely. So, um, Damien, I would first like to note that you are going to be awarded Mozilla's Super Trooper of the Month Award because I realize it is coming up on 1 a.m. where you are hanging on the digital video line. So we'd love to hit just two more questions and then give you a big uh, love bomb for your time with us because this is really fascinating. Uh, first of the last two questions. Right on. First of the last two questions. Um, how many times did you fail before succeeding, and, and how did you stay motivated after those failures? Uh, we fail all the time. Uh, I mean, there's, and I, and I, I guess it depends what you consider a success. I, you know, I'm, I'm writing an album right now, and I, I can promise you, I will write 20 times more songs than I actually record. Um, and, you know, and that's probably a, like a optimistic estimate. You know, like. Um, here is a good way to think about the things you make, I think. It's magic, essentially. Like think about, I'm going to do it from songwriting, but this video is the beginning. You take, you take beats and, and chords and you add them together and what do you get? You get beats and chords. And you look at it and you're like, yeah, well that's exactly what I put in and nothing has happened and it's boring and I hate myself. But every once in a while, you put beats and chords together, and you get lust or fury or or rage or or you know melancholy or joy and it, like or all those things wrapped up into one crazy indescribable emotion, and that's the magic. Like you got something out of nothing. You put these things together, and suddenly you've got like this human thing. It's amazing, um, and it's the it's the same with with the same with filmmaking. It's the same with writing. It's the same with every creative enterprise I know. Is it's sort of like most of the time you put stuff together, and it's exactly the sum of its parts. And you were so hoping it was going to be magical, and it's not really magical. But when you do hit those moments of magic, it's like you, you know, it's, it's like worth living for. Um, so, so I would say prepare to fail a lot, and and then and and in fact maybe even you know like. Set, set your bar high. Decide that success is like really high and let yourself fail tons. Um, because then when you get over that bar, you're going to be really psyched. Um, uh, that, and, and also, like, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the process. Like the, the, in the same way, that, you know, we, we built the Rube Goldberg machine and it, 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 it worked three times out of 89 times. And we did, we did the treadmill video. I think we got through it, again, I think we got through it three out of about 20 times. Um, all of our videos have incredible failure rates, and it's not just the videos; it's the ideas themselves. I mean, I can't tell you how many ideas we've come up with and realized, ah, eh, that's not that good of an idea, or you know, how many things we've tried. And, uh, it's not that great. It's just it's the process. If, if you kept all your ideas, it, you'd you'd be average. You know, be better than average. Very cool. Well, the last question: What current projects are you working on, and what can folks expect from you and the band? Um, we are working. OK Go is working on our new album. Um, we go into the studio in August, but it could be a while because sometimes we come out and decide we don't like any songs and do it all over again. Um, I just finished producing a record for a band called Lavender Diamond, and our own record label, um, Paracadute, will be putting that out in September. The album is really, really, really good, and I'm really proud of it. Um, uh, we have some big video projects that we hope to do along with our next album, um, including something might not even be music videos this time, but into more and better and weirder. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll be on tour to play all of that stuff uh, like next spring or summer. Um, it seems far away, but we have a whole album to record between now and then. So, yeah. 
Right on. Well, I cannot thank you enough on behalf of Mozilla and Popcorn and all of the folks that have been listening to you share your thoughts. And so we're just really grateful you've taken the time. Uh, I just want to thank you, and uh, look, we'll look forward to seeing what OKGo OK comes up with. And we wish you a good night's sleep, Damien. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thanks, everyone. I, I, uh, I know you're all out there. It's, fun, it's funny when you can only see yourself on the screen, but I know you're all out there, and you're rad. Make good stuff. Send us stuff. Make good stuff and then send it to us because we need good ideas. We need good. We'll steal your ideas. We won't actually steal your ideas. But we'd love to work with you. Send us stuff. You're great. Be awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye. Bye, Damien. Thanks. Have a great night. You. <laughs> thanks, man. Right on. And and thanks to everybody who asked all those amazing questions. That was a great feed, and apologize, apologies for the ones that we weren't able to get to. Jacob, let me toss over to you for a few wrap-up details. Cool. Everyone hear me? Um, so I hope that was fun for all of you. And I hope you guys are uh, playing around with some of the popcorn templates. Um, if you have any questions, uh, let me know uh, here in Seattle. We're going to uh, play around with the robots, and, and um, that's about it. So, uh, that's about it. so do you uh, ask any questions about the program? Ask questions about the program. Otherwise, we're going to uh, see you next week for Dr. O. We have Eileen and folks on the camera. Whoops. Hey folks, this is Brett from Mozilla. I um, wanted to thank everybody for joining in. And, and uh, in case uh, Jacob didn't mention this earlier, one of the uh, best and most important things you can do this week is share your work. Uh, like Damien said, um, it's really important that everybody shows one another what you're making. Um, and so um, send us your links, um, share with Jacob, and we'll definitely make sure that uh, all the other folks um, in other story camp locations as well as those participating in the Mozilla uh, Code Party will we'll see this work. We're really excited to see uh, what you guys think of uh, what we prepared for popcorn and the curriculum. And we're so grateful that, that you're all participating um, in this adventure with us. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So um, see you all. We'll all be together again next week. And we'll, we'll find you on Twitter on hashtag StoryCamp. Um, you can always email. I'm Jacob at MozillaFoundation.org. I'd love to see you. Um, we'll work it out. So thanks again. <laughs>